How is your memory? Do you find yourself forgetting things as you grow older? Does it matter? And if it does, is there anything we can do about it? Hello again, I'm Peter Bowes. This is the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. And with me again is Peter Allison. We've known each other since we went to school together in the 1970s. And now we're well, kind of working together again, contemplating the future, trying to figure out the science and the best way to maximise our health span. Hello again, Peter. Hello. Well, memory. Now, yes. so I'm... So, you know, I have a science background and I remember when I was a grad student, I could read a scientific paper and then I could go to write about it about two and a half, sometimes two years later. And I could remember the first author, the title, the journal and probably guesstimate the pages to within 50 pages. So I could then just go and Oh, yeah, I read that once two and a half years ago. I can go back and find it in the days when we had paper copies, of course. And oh, now I could read a paper in the morning and I could forget I've read it. But Well, I wouldn't forget I've read it, but I would need to go back to it in the afternoon. I, if I think if there was one thing about ageing that uh, concerns me more than anything else, it's it's that. It's l losing memory. Uh, that That concerns me. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And what's interesting to me, this is our third conversation in a matter of a few weeks. And we started certainly in the first episode of just reminiscing, talking about our school yeah. days. And it struck me how easy it was to do that. And some of the fine mm. detail that I still remember, quite literally 50 years ago, 1973 yeah, yeah. is when we started at the same school together. How it's yeah. easy to remember those details and what we got up to and the, you know, the, the excitement of going to school and, and, and some of the problems that we might have had during that time uh, compared with just remembering what I did last week or even yesterday, as, as you imply. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, it's, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've gone bald, so shaved my head because I've got you know, male pattern baldness. So I've shaved my head. Nah, I don't really care about that. Yeah, one of my teeth snapped off the other, uh, a year or so ago. Don't really care about that. None of that bothers me. It's the it's the memory. It's just, and I guess this question about whether or not this is normal or whether or not this is the sign of something darker. Because you know, I, I don't know about you, but I've got I have relatives who've got um, dementia, and I've watched the progr the progression of that. I guess a lot of people have, haven't we, in this day and age? We, as our, rel our older relatives live longer, so we're watching the, so we're watching the, the impact of dementia, Alzheimer's as things progress. Yeah, I think it is our heightened awareness of uh, certainly Alzheimer's. Mm. Alzheimer's is in, in the news a, a lot. There is mm. actually some positive news, and we'll, we'll get on yeah, to yeah. that uh, in a few moments. But it is, you, you're absolutely right, it, it's seeing what happens to relatives, uh, to, to, to friends of our generation. Mm. Even early onset Alzheimer's is, uh, is a big issue. And uh, just that fear that it's going to happen to us and well I suppose let's look on the positive side there is yeah. a certain amount that we can do and and just general physical fitness is uh, is a big part mm. of uh, perhaps uh, maybe not pre preventing Alzheimer's there is no cure sadly as we know mm. it yet for something like Alzheimer's but I think we know that being in generally a good physical condition is a good way to just perhaps delay it a few years yeah and I and I guess isn't isn't the high isn't that the high irony that the the most, the cheapest and the most cost-effective remedy is having is exercise, um, and yet it's the one that's the it's the it's the it's the high irony. It's the cheapest, and yet it's this requires this discipline, these lifestyle choices that are, and it's just so difficult to um, to implement and to, on a long-term basis. Isn't that ironic, though, right? It's a huge irony, and, uh, it, and the thing is, once you, you get into, and I know you have and, and I have, once you get into that routine of, of exercise, the benefits that you can mm. feel quite quickly, certainly speaking personally, it is enough to keep yeah. me going at it. It's enough to encourage me. But I know for a lot of people, it's just making that, that first 
step and the procrastination that goes into yeah. starting exercise can be difficult. But I want to talk, first of all, Peter, about the paper that actually you sent to me a few oh, days yeah. ago. You, you spotted this. And this is in the European Heart Journal, Diet, Cardiovascular Disease and Mortality in 80 Countries. The goal, they said, was to develop what they called a, a healthy diet score for different countries. This is a study based on almost 150,000 people from 21 countries. Uh, just, Peter, tell me a little bit more about this, and we'll get on to the conclusions, which, uh, to me, were quite striking. Well, yes, I mean, it's because the, the diet that they're encouraging people to take is it's just, a, I guess, it's no stranger to the sort of diets that we've all been encouraged to, to adopt before, and it's to eat fruit, nuts, legumes, fish, and dairy. I mean, I guess dairy, to some extent, people... Maybe there's a sort of like very differing messages that come across about the about dairy. Um, so there are these five things, um, and there's this massive epidemiological study. The focus of the paper, and I guess the differences in between this study and some of the other studies that I've come across, is this study is focused on the protective elements, the notionally protective elements of the diet, rather than the damaging elements of the diet. And one of the points that the lead author has made is that perhaps some of the, the conclusions from those papers which have been talking about the damaging effects of diet were really because it, it wasn't so much that people were eating too much of a damaging thing as that they weren't eating enough of the protective thing. So that was a, it was a, a, a very interesting cast to the story. And they, and as a result of that, they, the main point was is you've got to try and eat these protective foods, and if you do that, then eating a minimum amount, you know, like a, a sort of like a modest and a modest amount of some of the things like meat isn't such a big deal. And I say the conclusions were surprising because when I read the conclusion, I felt well. Didn't we know this already? And you, you kind yeah. of implied that as well, that if we eat this kind of diet with, with legumes, the kind of Mediterranean diet, maybe, maybe some yeah. full fat dairy, that the results are optimised in terms of our potential yeah. health span and indeed lifespan. And the one thing that they highlighted, of course, was that those richer nations tended to have better results. So those countries yes. with, with poorer diets had uh, less good outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. it's because it was if you're in the poorer countries, people can't afford or, uh, and have less access to these foods which have the which have which have the protective value. And I guess, you know, and, and it's again coming back to it is this notion of just a balanced diet and nothing in excess would be perhaps the sorts of things that, you know, perhaps we might have been our grandmothers might have told us about 50 years ago, perhaps. You know, that this, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm in no way decrying the work, of course, when I say that, because having a good scientific study, you don't just yeah. do things that your grandmother says, right? But, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so, I, yeah, but I mean, this notion of things in moderation, it just seems, it, 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 that just resonates, doesn't it? That just seems like a really good conclusion. Moderation is the phrase, the, the, the word that I use over and over again. It is perhaps one of the more boring words that you can use in, in terms of, longevity science because people think oh moderation that's not going to be much fun but time and time again supported by the science as you say that's why it is indeed good to have these yeah. large data studies backing up what we what we think we know but moderation in diet and yes a little bit of meat if if that's what you like a little bit of of dairy yeah. but the bulk of your diet being this kind of mediterranean diet lots of vegetables fruits legumes for for the bulk of your protein does time and time again show to be the, the best kind yeah. of combination that you, you can have. And I don't know about you, but as I look at longevity science and almost always, and I've said this before, that the final sentence is more studies are required. But I kind mm. of personally read between the lines, you know, add one study to the previous study that I've seen on a, a similar subject and kind of make up my own mind, unless it's something obviously very extreme. But if it's something as simple mm. as a, a moderate diet, I tend to think, well, I'm going to give that a go. That's that's the direction that I'm going to go in yeah. because of the weight of the, the body of the science. I, I mean, just to, pausing just to look back 50, 60 years, can you, going back into the 1960s, 1970s, how did you, can you remember how your diet at home changed during the 1960s to the 1970s? Because I can remember subtle things, big things that my diet, how my diet changed. 
Yeah, well, I can remember but certainly the 1970s. I was I was born in 62. You were born in 61, I believe 61. that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So I don't remember much about the 60s, but certainly the 70s, that was the age of margarine, wasn't it? I think around yes. about that time, margarine started to replace butter because we thought we can't all have all of these, you know, ultra high fat foods as part of our diet. And the science then seemed to suggest that, that margarine was the way to go. Now, of course, now, <laughs> half a century on, we look at margarine through a very different light. And I know as a as a kid, we had lots yeah. of... My mum was a great cook and she, she made beautiful uh, baked goods and gradually margarine replaced the butter. But I think as we understand it now, that probably wasn't a, a positive move. <laughs> Well, I suppose I was thinking about meat consumption. So in the 1960s, my mother worked in the school. She was the administrator of the school. My my father was a was a worked in a, a, the local authority as a as a bricklayer, and I I, I saw so the Sunday roast for my parents was a chicken, and I don't. And then gradually towards around about the early 70s, it included pork, and beef was something that was just too expensive. And I was just so I just think going back from that time is just it, it it was almost it was difficult to eat too much meat because it was more expensive and then everything just became so cheap so you could afford to buy any time you want almost and I and I'm just sort of paused and was thinking about that and the way that epidemiological research and and different different um, dietary studies have uh, have been discussed the um, you know the impact of eating too much meat because again if I'm personal about it you know I love bacon I love a bacon sandwich but you know if I eat bacon I my my knees start to hurt a little bit and I don't feel terribly good afterwards so even though I like I've just I, not because of dietary I've just decided I just don't think it's right for me anymore um yeah I now, that's really interesting because, I mean, I think I probably had a very similar diet as it applied to meat in those, uh, you know, teenagers uh, especially, uh, and chicken, red meat, beef on a, a Sunday, mm. Sunday dinner, uh, was, was generally the staple diet. I do remember, though, never being a particularly huge fan of eating meat, as, especially red meat. Mm. I didn't mind chicken so much, but I was never a huge fan of it. And as I've grown older, I've kind of acknowledged that more. And it's not part of my diet anymore. A, because I don't particularly enjoy it, but B, because I, I think I understand that it's, it's probably not the best diet for me and that I should stick to vegetables and, and fruits and, and those you know, the legumes and the beans and peas for, for my protein. It, it, it's about the importance of finding what's right for the individual, isn't it? And listening to what your body's saying. Well, listening to what your body says and doing what we, you and I do, and, and, and not, not everyone is in a position to do this, to, to do yeah. deep dives into science. But uh, I, I certainly yeah. follow the science. And as I say, things may, may not be proven to, to be an absolute fact in, in terms of, of science and the scientific yeah. method. But I think we can see the, uh, at least I feel as if I can see the direction that, that diet science is yeah. going in. Let's move yeah. on to memory. Peter, and the, the first of uh, kind of two related studies. One is a study that is published in Nature, Anti-Aging Protein Injection Boosts Monkeys' Memories. Uh, and this is billed as the first primate study to show cognitive benefits of the protein clotho, which could be a step forward, it says, towards clinical applications. In, in other words, a step forward to its use in human beings. And we're not there yet, but the Results yeah. show in monkeys uh, quite a lot of promise. Yeah, it, it is. And so what they do is that, I mean, the, the test of cognitive ability for these monkeys was that they hide some food somewhere and then they go to see how successful the monkeys are going to be able to find the food. And in their control, in the control um, study, the monkeys were finding the food at 45 percent of the time. And then when they had this injection of clotho, they were finding it 60 percent of the time. So it was making them um, it was more effective. And, and, I, and what was interesting is that the authors were saying they're not quite sure why this is the case. Uh, and it was they were getting low doses. They they've noticed that in people who've got dementia as they get older, that they have lower levels of this clotho present in their body. So low levels of uh, uh, of clotho are associated with uh, cognitive decline. So they give the injections, and it seems to help. It make it seems to slow the decline by a third. But they're not quite sure of the mechanism. So it's so yeah, it's really really quite exciting, isn't it? 
It is. And I think it's exciting because the study was done in monkeys, which obviously a very mm -hmm. close relation to, to human beings yeah. as, a, as opposed to, to fruit flies or, or mice in the laboratory. Just on a little aside, Peter, I, I was particularly interested in the, the methodology in, in terms of what they did with these monkeys. And, and these were rhesus monkeys. And yeah. just going back to my post-school days, pre-journalism days, I, I studied biology at college and, and was for a while destined for a career in science. And I worked for a while for the Medical Research Council in London. And I was working with a group looking at, at dementia and, uh, and schizophrenia and, and some of the diseases of, of old age. And my role in this research was to train, in, in my case, marmoset monkeys, little tiny little monkeys that could sit in your hand, to do exactly this kind of thing, to distinguish between two objects. And the reward was a little piece of banana in a well uh, that they could reach sure. out and, and, and get into. And um, th this, this study obviously was slightly different. It was looking at uh, neurotransmitters, short-term memory, long-term memory. But it, it just sort of rekindled a few memories for me in terms of that, that time, a very rewarding time working with these little animals, that it was a very short-acting drug that we, we use, but it, it significantly mm -hmm. affected their, in the case of these uh, experiments, their, their, their short-term memory. And uh, so going back to this study, again, I think it is, it is interesting. And again, let's stress so we don't know the implications for this mm. in, in human beings but the, the fact that they're getting these quite striking results in in monkeys is is fascinating yeah and i guess um so i'm 62 in october so hopefully maybe by the time that we are in our 80s and we're starting to worry about these things hopefully there's some hope for us yet when i was younger i was very much a um a destination driven individual is I would have a destination a target for where I was going to go and the journey was something to be ignored as you focus on the on the destination and I think at the time I think you I, I lost out on opportunities and experiences by focusing on the des on the destination rather than the journey and I look again and I just pausing you know just as we're speaking talking about dementia and things is at the moment I'm in pretty good health and I I think the great opportunity there is to say I'm in pretty, pretty good health now and everything's I should really seize the day and not let concern for things like that because I can't have there's no point having a concern for things that I can't have any impact on so I don't want to lose the quality of what I got by dwelling too much upon what might happen in 15 years time or whatever yeah, I'm totally with you. And of course, by enjoying the present day and enjoying your good health, you are actually probably impacting yeah. your potential for getting some of these diseases uh, without actually thinking about it too deeply. In other words, uh, yeah. just exploiting the, the good health that you have now, I think could be beneficial in the future. The, the third study I just wanted to mention has had a lot of news coverage in the, the past few days is uh, a new drug which is being hailed as a, a potential turning point in Alzheimer's uh, treatment. This isn't a, a cure for Alzheimer's, but it shows uh, significant effects in terms of the, the cognitive decline. And this is essentially a drug that gets rid of some of that, that plaque that, that clogs up the brain, putting it very simplistically, which is uh, mm. a, at one of the, the root causes of uh, the decline that we see in people with Alzheimer's. And again, the, the studies here do involve human beings. So it, it's, it's very relevant to all of us. And uh, it, it is showing that, that there are some potential side effects and, and, and people need brain scans as, as they're using this drug. But the, the studies so far show quite a lot of um, promising results. Yes, I mean, so I, I think I was fascinated because how, first of all, I, I was wanting to know how they measured the decline of people um, and so it turns out that there is a a 144 point score on um, dementia related decline and they ha looked at the uh, decline of people in the control group and they compared it with the decline of people who were on this drug over a 75 week period and it was a score of I think the, the people in the control group had a decline of nine points and people in, taking the drugs had a score or they lost six on this on this declining scale so there was a, it slowed the rate of decline by about a third yeah 
which is pretty good. I mean, the, but the side effects uh, could be quite, again, the side effects impacted a third of the people. So the third seems to be the magic number here. So a third of the people who were on this treatment had some side effects and some of them were, were quite serious. So, but I guess, you know, if you've got dementia, then you need, you need to make those hard choices, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, it is interesting, and I, I, the British, the, the NHS, uh, the National Health Service in the UK, is considering this drug for for potential use. Uh, just to say that this is a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. There's a lot more detail in that, and I'll put the link to it in, in the show notes for this episode. But I think, in terms of measuring its effect, I think essentially what they looked at was the increased ability of, of people to carry out everyday tasks yeah. and to, to, to keep on living uh, as normal mm. a life as possible, which uh, I guess when you have what is still an incurable condition is what you would want. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, greater time to spend with family and doing the sort of creative, enriching things that you enjoy and, and delight in. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and that's essentially what it what it's what it's all about. This seems, Peter, to have been this explosion in research, looking at, at dementia and the possible ways to at least slow down the progress of the disease. It, it seems, I mean, thankfully, I mean, there are many areas of, of longevity research that could do with a huge injection of, of cash, but there does seem in the scientific community to be a, a willingness, and it seems the funds to, to do this kind of research. Well, I guess it's that there is a, a huge body of people who will be suffering from um, Alzheimer's or dementia, and so there is an awful lot of you know it's it's money to be made in 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 serving you know in serving this great need and so I, I, that's that's the driver for it and I, i'm not being I, i'm not making any negative comment about the money really but you know it, 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 that, that 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 these studies are tremendously expensive so there has to be a has to be a driver for, to get people to actually do to do to put all this money out in the first place because so many of you know, a lot of these drugs which are tested and developed not all of them make it to market i mean and right. it's an expensive process you have probably a, a better perspective than i do in terms of the money behind scientific research and, and what drives studies like this and that there has to be a positive financial outcome yeah as well is, is this something you found in in your research so I, I I think in my work which is a very very different field so I was a, a, a geologist and I think right. that when you're doing my research there I, I would look at research and I would find some research that I thought well I can get some industrial money for this and then I could think of some research which I would think of well that looks like it's going to be really fun and I'm going to be really, really interesting, but I'm not really going to get any money for that, I don't think. So I would have to have a sort of like a balanced portfolio of work and you know, just to make sure because, you know, you you always have to have your annual appraisal and you've got to be able to go up and say what you've done. Um, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm just a really good way forward i mean that's just good management so i I, I'm, I'm not complaining about that at all i just think it was a really good way to have things and i also think that having this you know this expectation for me working in a university an expectation that you have to go out and get money when i first started i found it i, I found it very difficult but then after I, I just found it was it drives creativity because you start collaborating with people that maybe you wouldn't have collaborated on and you start coming across ideas that maybe you wouldn't have had before. Um, so I, I, I really like that. Um, and I can really, and I can really sort of like sympathize with it because if you, if you have a goal and a drive, if something's driving you along, it just forces you to be more creative and more, you know, and it's that creativity when people suddenly start having ideas. I, I mean, I don't want one of the things I really loved was talking with scientists from different disciplines when I was collaborating with people. And I used to think of it, it, it was a little bit like a game of battleships where you were sort of like trying to talk to each other and you, the conversations would be, you'd be like firing off and the other person would be not quite understanding because they'd gone from a different discipline. And then gradually the sort of like the, the the conversations would coalesce 
and then you'd be hitting on a target as you suddenly you you have these several conversations and then you target you realize you're understanding each other and then everything just gets to be really creative that's interesting to me and, and especially in terms of the collaboration that you mentioned and just relating it to our conversations that we've been having over the last few weeks yeah. i find it hugely encouraging and beneficial just to have conversations with someone who is like-minded and obviously you're, you're kind of chasing the same kind of goal to mm. me and I think that is relatable to our professional lives where we collaborate with people and yes we might be collaborating with a, an organization that's providing funds for the, for the research or whatever the, the project is and, and you're just thinking really post-COVID how it is actually nice to be getting back I know we're, we're talking remotely here but how it is actually nice in, in other areas of our lives to be able to face to face collaborate with people well i think it is and, and i think there's another i think there's a sort of like a, a a parallel with exercise there isn't there because when we go we go to the gym and we try to do something and we make our muscles hurt and we know that when they're hurt, hurting a little bit that's good because that's when they're starting to they start to do things and get a bit stronger and i think that when we go out and we meet people and we collaborate people and we have to we've got to find ways of getting on and collaborating and things and i, and I think that's sort of like that's testing our minds a bit isn't it it's testing our social skills and it's making sure that we can interact with other people and so i think that's good that's a, that's an exercise of our social of our of our social practice of our sociability and i think that's that's a good thing and i can and i think during covid that must have massively been impacted and it's just lovely to go out and start meeting people again I mean, you go and do it all the time with your interviews through work. For me, I go on, I, I, I guess, recreationally, I go on dive boats. I often meet people I don't know before. That's just lovely, just chatting away to people from different backgrounds. You're on, it might be on a boat for a week, so you, everyone knows that you have to try and get on. So it, it's just good practice. And I'm... I, I, I'm sure there must be work that's been done on that and the impact that that has on our um, the, our health span as regards our mental abilities, but I'm sure that's positive. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Just one final thought and really just going back to where we started, Peter, in terms of memory, memory loss, how things change as we get older. Do you have any tricks yeah you've talked about tricks before in terms of motivational tricks to get you to do things do you have any tricks or lifestyle hacks that that helps with your memory and helps you remember where you put the car keys <laughs> oh uh, well uh, okay this is a conversation that my uh, you should probably have with my wife so <laughs> i would say that uh, so for little things like that i only put my keys in one of three places around the house my keys and my wallet, and if I'm going to the office, my swipe card, they're only in one of three places. Uh, they don't go anywhere else. I always just put things in a small number of places. So that's how I remember. My wife, on the other hand, puts things down all over the place and is always forgetting things. So, you know, we are. Yeah, no, it's the same with my partner as well. We have constant conversations where we always think the other one is is worse in this respect in terms of losing things. But but I'm like you. I, I put my keys. Uh, I mean, I I've even got a drawer in my office that says car keys. I, you know, I'm that anal about yeah. it. But um, it works, <laughs> and I generally know where they are. On that note, Peter, always good to talk to you. Um, I think you're off on a diving trip fairly soon, aren't you? I am indeed, and um, I shall be away for uh, I'll be, should be away for a while, and I'll um, show you some pictures when I get back. I look forward to that. Have a great time, Peter. We'll talk soon. Okay, look forward to it.